This meeting is being recorded by the Yo, yo, yo. Got it. What's up, dog? Yo. uh, Who's Pay? Is that that your real name? Nope. (laughs) I'm locked. So I have a color session on Zoom in an hour that I just had to log in (laughs) to the guy who's been emailing all the guys who are going to join the meeting. I had to log in to his account to start. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stay logged in. My name is not. (laughs) <laughs> but my last name is spelled differently than what you put in this note. Okay, so it's not Re- it's not Reinhardt. It's I, Rein- I, it's Reinert. I, I went to your Instagram and I saw Reinert. Yep. And I was like, where did I did I just make that up? Reinhardt. I think every, I think everybody makes it up. And there it's like a brain thing. It's like your brain yeah. like yeah. People that's- think people think it's People think it's Reinhardt, even though like I feel like there's enough people in the world now that know who like Rob Reiner is. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, it's the same name. It's it's the, well, the T. It's just the T. Okay, okay. The T at the end really throws people off, and it's like, oh, it's Reinhardt because yeah. there are Reinhards, but yeah, not it's not me. I get it's the same me. thing because I get uh, Alfonso. People, Alfonso is a first name for a lot of people, uh-huh. so if it's like. If my name is, if it's, I'm listed as Spencer Alfonso in like a doctor sheet, if someone's Mexican or Spanish or something, uh, they'll go Alfonso Spencer and they'll call me Alfonso and I'll just go with it. Cause it's like back when I was in soccer, I was <laughs> Alfonso. Cause like people don't want to accept that my first name is Spencer. They're <laughs> just like, no, it yeah. doesn't make any sense. Your first name I understand. is Alfonso. <laughs> I understand. Completely. Well, I apologize for the, uh, for rewriting your name in a completely wrong way. I caught it. I was looking that's at your okay. Instagram. I was like, I totally mm-hmm. spelled that wrong. And I spelled it wrong from the moment I met you. That's that's probably what happened. Like you put me in your phone? Mm-hmm. Oh, so that, I, that, I didn't give myself <laughs> I didn't give myself <laughs> any opportunities to get it right. Well, uh, we were we just should... we were just sleeping in a hotel room together, so it was yeah. pretty informal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll introduce you and then we can talk about how we met. So Simon okay. Reinert. Is that correct pronunciation as well? That is correct. Okay, Simon Reiner is a director and cinematographer based out of Chicago and has worked on music videos uh, for Anthony Ramos, Leslie Odom Jr., Ben Platt. On top of that, you directed an awesome documentary for the Hamilton production, um, and you've done ads and plenty more. Um, You and I met because we were both at a conference for a company called Music Bed and Film Supply. And uh, I think I flew in and there was like a Slack channel and someone it was in the sh- Slack channel. You know, I, I think I showed up a day before the conference saying, hey, I wasn't expecting to uh, show up early, but I just flew out. I don't have a place to stay. Does anyone want a roommate? And then I, I think I said yes. And then that's how we met, right? That's exactly how it happened. Uh, yeah, I, I think I may may I, I think I made a last minute change uh, in my plans and was like, hey, I actually think I can go to this conference. But you know, it's like going to a wedding the day before. All the hotel rooms were booked in the entire city. It was like in all the booked out all the booked out hotel rooms in the hotel that we were actually staying in were it was just completely sold out. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to actually get a hotel room in the city. And I'm, I'm probably just going to have to stay an hour outside of, you know, Fort Worth just to go to the thing. But lo and behold, Alfonso <laughs> Spencer. Alfonso <laughs> Spencer. <laughs> and it's Simon uh, Reinhardt. <laughs> and invited me into his hotel room and it was, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, we we ordered uh, late night BLTs or something like that, or turkey sandwiches. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the following night, you had your own place, and you were already up and running, working and running an edit, and yeah. talking to a composer. I was very efficient on that trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that normal for you? Are you usually no. working around the clock, or is there more downtime? Uh, I have a, I have a lot of downtime. So, I mean, I, I have kids, so I try to prioritize work around, uh, family. So, 
and I work from home. I work for myself. I'm a freelancer for the past six years. So I can, as long as I can plan out my own time, then, uh, you know, I can plan around those big edit moments. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a director and I'm a cinematographer and I'm an editor. So I, if I'm not doing one of those things, I'm probably doing the other thing, but I, I do tend to try and space out these jobs so that I do have time to, you know, prioritize the things that actually matter. Um, but yeah, on that particular trip, I think I was like double timing, like two or three jobs. So I was like, well, got to take the hard drive on the road. And I think I took my like graphics card on the road. Like it was a full, <laughs> just, just to play back the footage on my laptop in whatever year that was, 2017, uh, maybe 2015. When was that? I don't even remember. Yeah. Was I, would say, I think 2017 is right. I think that's, yeah, that sounds about right. It feels a lot longer, but it, it does. Um, but yeah. Anyway, not often am I just like traveling with hard drives and graphics cards <laughs> to do edits on the road. Um, but you know, I had a hotel room to myself, <laughs> at least for one night. And I was like, you know what? I'm actually going to be productive this time instead of just like watch the office and fall asleep. Mm-hmm. So uh, tell me, did you, were you always connected to Chicago or were, no. where did you grow up? So I'm from Alabama. The long, the long story short is I'm from Alabama. When I was 21, I had dropped out of school and had started like a photo slash video production company in Alabama because I felt like that was the thing to do. Um, I wasn't learning enough in school and I was learning more on YouTube than (laughs) in a classroom. So, uh, you know, I bought a whole bunch of camera gear and started shooting things and, uh, a larger production company in Virginia was, um, there's a guy named John Carl who, uh, I went to business with for about five years. Um, he was down there in Alabama at a concert that I was filming and we just met and he was like, Hey, I run this company up in Virginia. You should come intern. And at the time I was taking a break from college. Didn't know that I would never go back. But, uh, I went up to Virginia where his production company was and, uh, was up there for 10 weeks and they told me to stay. So I stayed and, you know, a year later we moved to New York and, we're shooting commercials and music videos and documentaries and that kind of, you know, jumped off my entire career outside of college. You know, I was doing very small things when I was living in Alabama, but then that kind of boosted my confidence and gave me access to, you know, a totally new world of stuff in about a year's time, which maybe would have taken, you know, five to 10 years had I done it on my own. But um, that was a very, that was a critical moment in the career. And then uh, after after we stopped working together full time, you know, I, I'd gotten married. I needed to kind of control my own time and life. And, you know, we still we still worked together on and off for a little while. But, um, you know, then I got married, had a kid, then just had another kid. And, you know, th- life happens and you just start reprioritizing things. So, you know, my career evolved after after that whole thing went down. But. That was that was a big that was a big thing. What what company was that? Uh, that was called the Duck Duck Collective. And oh, it nice. was it was me, John Carl, and a guy named Matthew Addington, and we kind of three dudes running around with five D Mark threes shooting commercials, and uh, then you know slowly but surely that people say you know we only have twenty thousand dollars. Oh, we only have fifty thousand dollars. Oh, oh my god. We, oh, we only have a quarter million dollars, and then. Uh, you know, the commercials got bigger and the cameras got bigger and the crew got bigger and, uh, yeah, it evolved as it does. And so how do you like, when you come into that type of thing and you're growing into these gigs, how much of a business mindset did you have on that team? Or were you primarily just like, were you pitching or were you get receiving the the when like, I when I started, I was very much just I mean, I was like the jack of all trades, right? I was like the boom operator and also the editor and also the B cam operator and sometimes the A cam operator. Um, but I was very rarely on the pre-production phone call that seals the deal, a part of the bid. I mean, every once in a while I would be making the treatment that may win the job, but it was very much um I wasn't really in control of 
what we were doing. It was just, you know, we would receive an email and we would all kind of collaborate, you know, collaborate on some bigger idea. And then hopefully that was the winning, you know, hopefully that was enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I, you know, I had a lot of responsibility, but business wise, it, it was totally out of my hands. Mm -hmm. I was very much just on the creative side, um, pressing the buttons and, you know, doing the late night edits while everybody else left kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And has your role evolved as you're now a freelancer? Are you still completely? One? Yeah. So what, what's that evolution look like? Like, how did you coming out of that partnership where you're primarily creative, how did that evolve to the next stage? So I, since breaking out of that company, um, I've worked with just a ton more people, um, individually. Oh, someone's calling me. What, what were we talking about? <laughs> so basically what you're doing now, like, um, yeah, okay, client so relation. What, every, like, everything has, everything has changed, uh, since going freelance on my own. Um, I've gotten to work with a lot more people across the board, which just means I've played different roles, uh, you know, with other production companies and, um, I've just, I, you have more experience the more you work with these people. So, um, I've been a part of pre-production calls now and, you know, I've been involved in numbers, pitches and bids, and just like more of the business oriented logistics of how to win a job and how much it costs to do a job and how much it costs to, you know, it's these line items, you know, it's the, it's how much money do we have for crew? How much money do we have for gear? How much money do we have for locations and wardrobe and makeup? And, you know, you just, you start storing all of these little line items as to how much these things cost, which means to a client who's asking you, Hey, can you do this for X? You can say yes or no and know what you can and cannot do who you can hire, what cameras you're, you know, it, it becomes this full, full vision of what the job is actually going to look like. Is it a one man band? Is it three people or is it 50 people, you know? Um, and sometimes the best ones you do are with three people. And sometimes the best ones you do are with 50 people. And it kind of, it varies, but, um, the knowledge of what these jobs actually look like from a glance, uh, from a pre-production call, uh, has gotten a lot more clear over the years. Yeah. Do you find that you still are saying yes to the like one man band things? Like, will you still be like, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take this on myself. Or is that part pass? Not often. Am I just doing a solo gig? Editing is one thing. Post-production is one thing because I can do everything from right here where we're sitting. Um, and I can manage data and I can, you know, send files and meet deadlines and I can do color and I can do sound and I can, you know, everything is, everything is self-contained. Um, and a lot of other people are collaborating with me just at another computer somewhere else. But mm -hmm. when it comes to, when it comes to one man banding, uh, I haven't done a one man band production in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for a while I was working for uh, a church in New York and that was maybe the last time that I was just doing something solo just because I was the only one, you know, and mm -hmm. then that team expanded. And then after it grew enough, I left and went more freelance. Um, but since then it's been crews. Um, every once in a while you'll go out with a small group. So, you know, it's a director, maybe me as a DP and like an AC and maybe a sound guy. And you can kind of, crush whatever whatever you're shooting with you know at least three or four people but just doing this like one or one or two person thing is uh not that fun <laughs> so it's great it's past the point where that's like creatively inspiring you can do it but i've you know from a from a creative control perspective like not involving too many people in the process so that you can do whatever you want um, I've found that that used to be the case when I was trying to simplify everything, but, you know, just having an extra set of hands to, you know, hand lenses around or hold something, you know, like it just becomes, you use people as tools, uh, a lot more effectively 
mm-hmm. and more efficiently when you're doing, you know, when you're doing a group project. <laughs> yeah. As a, as a, as opposed to, you know, literally doing everything yourself. There's a, there's a lot more room for error when you're just doing everything by yourself. Yeah. So, uh, when you're shooting a piece like, a a dramatic, uh, cinematic thing that is say, if I were to look mostly on your portfolio, on your website, am I think seeing things that are mostly scripted and, uh, you know, have storyboards or, are these things that you're showing up and capturing the moment and finding the story once you get there? So I'm mostly doing, you know, I, I do probably three different things. I do commercial production. I do commercial documentary work. So just branded content. Um, that's more long form, you know, long form being three to five minutes as opposed to 30 or 60 seconds. And then we have music videos. So I'm not doing narrative films all that often. I'm not doing short films, but it's mainly advertising and music videos. Um, Advertisements are almost always storyboarded. The script is written beforehand um, and, you know, we're either shooting to the boards or we are um, a lot of the time it's storyboarded. Like we just have exactly what we're going into, especially studio shoots. You know, I, I do a fair amount of studio work where everything is very much on purpose. Um, but yeah, these scripts that are written beforehand by these agency writers, um, they're, you know, they're like the Bible that we take with us on the shoot and we just live by it and try not to shoot anything around it. Um, so, uh, when it comes to music videos though, you know, the lyrics are, it's more mood boarded it's not necessarily specific. It's kind of like, here's some shot ideas and here's the mood that we're going for, but let's see what happens. Um, you know, and unless it's like a very choreographed thing, um, the dance is what we're following. Um, I don't know. Everything is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, there's, there's still so much planning that goes on to these shoots before I ever even step foot into the conversation. Um, as a director, I dictate that a lot more. Um, I'm kind of, you know, I just finished a, you know, 60 second healthcare ad script that was written very, it's like a very personal ad. It got killed, but that's from another political perspective that, you know, it didn't, it's not because of me, it's because of them. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) but I just, you know, I spent a month writing this thing with the agency and, you know, flip flopping it back and forth and saying, this is too dramatic. This is this, you know, and, but the concept was sound and I just spent so much time storyboarding it out and pulling mood boards and reference frames. And, you know, it was this, the, the entire ad was already done. We just had to go shoot it. Right. Um, and then for whatever reason, you know, some things just don't work out, but the amount of planning that went into that just concept just to pitch to the client and say, we know what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do, um, is pretty invaluable. Mm -hmm. So what happens in that situation where you spend a month doing pre-production and then you essentially something changes, something, they go a different direction. Like what do you mentally do when those emails come in and you're like, okay, so all that time, it's not wasted because you learned a bunch from it, but how do you transition back into the creative who's now onto the next scene? Like how do you, how much time does it take to get that project out of your mental headspace and then prepare for the next thing? It's hard. I mean, right now I literally have four projects that are all tracking at the same time. So oh, either, either I'm planning for a shoot and then I'm editing, you know, completing uh, an edit for another job, but then I'm coloring another job and they're all completely different moods and styles. And, you know, maybe I shot one, maybe I, you know, just received footage for another one. Uh, a lot of the time, um, they start to overlap and it's uh-huh. pretty frustrating. And it's pretty frustrating, um, uh-huh. from a creative perspective, because I'd like to just start and finish one, but that never really happens. I have, I have two projects on my hard drive that, uh, we shot last September we started editing it immediately. And then about six months later, we picked it back up and kept editing it. And now maybe in the next two weeks, we need to finish it. So I've been dipping in and out of this project, um, for over a year now. And it's just kind of, you know, 
not to mention like just the data management on all this stuff, like being the sole keeper of the files, like there's a backup somewhere, but the project is only backed up so many times on my computer before I'm, you know, solely responsible for these entire, you know, campaigns. Um, and if I lose, even if I, you know, <coughs> pull up the wrong version after <laughs> not touching it for six months, um, it's hard to, it's hard to keep track of it, but I also, that's my job at this point. So I have to keep track of it. So it's, it's a, I share my brain is split down the middle a lot of the time where I'm running logistics just on, you know, my own data management versus even just keeping the creative of these projects together. Um, you know, entire like after effects compositions that have to, you know, that I have like a thousand little bats flying around in one of them. That's like comped into this like cave shot that I have to, you know, and maybe the plugin expires after a certain, like maybe it's, maybe I upgrade something on accident and everything breaks and I have to go back and fix it. Like there's so many things that happen when you're, when you're tracking too many projects at once. Uh, and it kind of happens all the time. Um, and I, I just have to keep tabs on all of those things on top of just the creative, like just making these things good. Um, and it's, you know, it's just, it takes up so much of my brain power just to keep tabs on maintaining these projects not to mention when they're overlapping like that's a whole those are two totally different things i guess yeah it's it's the administration side of a creative project that yeah is like not attractive from the outside looking in i think you kind of probably have a passion that draws you to these creative projects when we're kids we're like we want to direct we want to shoot we want to make music and then now at the age that we're at we're like, man, this stuff is just spreadsheets and files and folders. And <laughs> to be clear, <laughs> I'm, I actually love Excel. Oh, good. I bet that's um, a huge advantage. Which is a very weird thing. Like in high school, like I was on the robotics team. Granted, I was like the oh. photographer and the videographer and the website designer. Um, but I, you know, I'm slightly math focused in, you know, from a lighting perspective as a cinematographer and from just a planning logistics side, like I'm constantly just like optimizing my computer and you know, there's just a lot of like computer stuff that happens behind the scenes. Um, I'm not solely one thing, like I'm not just a cinematographer, I'm not just a director who's just like writing and slaving over ideas. Um, it's to do all of these things, I have to just split my brain in two, um, you know, not to mention that uh, I'm, I run my own business, you know, I like, I sell digital products. I, uh, you know, all of this stuff, like I'm an employee of my own company at this point for tax reasons. And that's a whole other side of just management that I've just wrapped my head around. You know, every, every year I try to add some new thing that I need to teach myself to, you know, keep myself relevant and upgraded and, you know, it evolves all the time, but I'm, constantly splitting my brain farther and farther apart. <laughs> yeah, well, let's talk about each of those things. That's all really interesting. So the the spreadsheet side of your brain that was on the robotics that's constantly upgrading your computer, What what is the, um, like when did that start for you? Um, was that something as a kid that you've always been into? Always. Charts, math, science, those were, as, those were passions of yours from the beginning? There's a really good video of me and I don't know if I'll ever be famous, but there's a really good video of me. If anybody ever makes a documentary about my life for whatever reason, there's a really good video of me sitting in a chair reading a magazine and my dad like turns on the video camera when I'm like three years old and he's like, say hi to the camera. And I look up at him and I don't even say hi. I just like look at this camera that he's holding and I'm like, let me see. Let me see that. <laughs> <laughs> and he like kneels down so I can like look through the like little viewfinder. And I'm like, I can't see anything. Like I couldn't figure out like how to blink my eye to look through the hole. Uh -huh. But it's this very cute, like from, from age zero, basically I was always just like interested in tech. My dad's uh -huh. like a, he was in a band growing up. Like, uh, he just had like tech gear all over the house, like music gear and computers and, um, anyway, it was just like, I could take apart a computer, look on, on the inside and put it back together. I would like, you know, down to just 
taking apart like an old CRT TV and seeing what was inside or like taking apart the TV remote and seeing how that works. You know, I've always just kind of been interested in physical tech, um, which then has evolved into just like having, you know, having this giant Rolodex of like camera gear and computer gear and, you know, plugins. And it's just, it's such a wide array of just like fun technology um, that I've always kept myself interested in. The Microsoft Excel stuff is, you know, that's just a complete other weird nerdy part of just like calculating, you know, calculating my taxes and how much I need to separate for, uh, you know, how, how much I can put away in my tax account and how much I need to send to like, if an agent was involved, how much I can send to an agent and just keeping tabs on all of these things so that I can play it, pay estimated quarterly taxes on top of paying myself and paying those like monthly income tax. You know, it's, it's all, all kinds of just weird stuff that I've just learned over the years. Um, but these like foundational tools that I might have, you know, just used for fun as a kid, uh, have, you know, actually been these lifelong, tools now that are just fully integrated into my day-to-day life. So the business development, is that something that you learned from YouTube or is that something that you've always been interested in? Cause it sounds like you're an S corp or an LLC or something like that. I'm an S corp that files as an LLC. Um, I've learned that from other people who have done it. Um, at a certain point you make a certain amount of money, uh, And it doesn't make sense to pay all those taxes Mm -hmm. anymore. Um, And someone very wise told me that I needed to just start a business so I could actually like hire employees eventually and Mm -hmm. pay them properly and also pay myself a salary and have a business account as opposed to just it being me. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, other people kind of walked me through that process, uh, and why it was beneficial. Um, it was not a YouTube video. It was simply just like career advice from a peer who was like, you do this right. And I was like, I don't know anything about what that is. Um, and it's been wildly helpful. You know, I, I just, I save a lot of money on taxes. Um, now that I have all of those legitimate things and the, you know, I can give myself health insurance if I want to, I can give myself, um, you know, you just get business benefits when you're a business. Um, mm-hmm. I can write off big computer purchases. I can, you know, if I need to, I can get certificates of insurance for rental renting gear. That's, you know, $200,000 worth of rental gear or, or whatever. It's just, it makes you a little more legitimate and it, you know, makes you into a full grown business adult and you can, you know, you don't have to ask daddy for money anymore. You can just kind of run it through the business and it's nice. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And that's that's another factor of all this that I think is something that I've learned over the years too, is that, yeah. And Cause I think when people see your work, I think it's very emotional and it doesn't come across as someone who loves so many things that you love. It seems like you're the director. It doesn't come across that I love Microsoft Excel. <laughs> it doesn't, <laughs> you know, when you see your stuff, it's like, I was watching the uh, Patagonia piece and it has a very Red Dead Redemption, Quentin Tarantino kind of feel, you know? And that's not something, love and, Red and Dead if you Redemption. know, yeah, so good. And if you if you know Quentin Tarantino and, and what it takes to make those things, it makes sense that you would love computers and Excel and all these things because, those are huge companies, huge productions, lots of details. But I think that's that's what's exciting about your work is that when you see it, I would believe it if you were to tell me, oh, I just showed up with my camera and met this guy and filmed it. And it and just, doesn't just to see what would happen. Yeah, because it feels organic. And I think that's probably why brands enjoy working with you, because it does to be feel, clear, that Patagonia piece was a lot of let's see what happens. Um, okay. That's what I was wondering. um, Like that, that one, that one particularly was not as storyboarded as the rest. It was Mm -hmm. kind of, we, we knew that we had access Mm -hmm. to this guy and we knew that he had this piece of property and, you know, we, we planned it out enough, but like, you know, even the script that we wrote, we wrote it while we were down there, like on day two or three, um, you know, we weren't shooting to it necessarily, but that was one of those more, more passion project level pieces, um, where we had enough people down there to all kind of butt our heads. It was more like a, you know, five day film festival in our own, you know, 
it was our own uh, extracurricular. It, no one was really paying us to do it. It was very much, we just had access. We need to go do it because this is great. So um, yeah, tell that, me, tell that, me that was, what it that is. Was less of, that was less of an ad uh, for a major brand and more of a, we think that this, this will actually just be a really cool project to be a part of. Yeah, so what exactly is it? Because uh, Patagonia is a place, but it's also a brand. So which one... So it's not for Patagonia, the brand. Okay. Is it, and and what's the connection then of the location to, there's a, there's a, uh, a brand name after it, right? So the, the idea, what the idea behind that particular project was, um, there was a business that had started down there. That was a luxury travel company called mm. Fika mm-hmm. and it was run by this guy. Um, who a friend of mine knew and had a neighboring ranch down there on his property. And um, my friend is a photographer and he said, hey, this guy is starting this company and he just wants like an experience ad. He just wants, you know, to show off a little bit of what he can offer. So if that's, you know, playing golf or playing polo or going fishing or boar hunting or horseback riding or anything. Let's just make it into this kind of high energy thing and go down there and just watch him do what he does. Um, so, you know, before we knew it, we were in a helicopter flying over like the mountains and looking at volcanoes and like that. There's a service where people go on a hike and a helicopter brings you like cocktails out of like oh a Yeti God. cooler and drops it off of your campsite and then takes off. And then now you have like, you know, like nice little G and T while you're sitting by the fire it like a hundred miles away from nothing. And you're just like, that's like a weird luxury experience that he wanted to be able to offer to clients who would be a part of this thing. Anyway, it was this luxury travel experience and, um, uh, we had access to all of these cool locations and people and, it was great. So we were invited down there to come and shoot that. And that was kind of that project. Um, we had a lot of creative control over it. No one was really pulling the strings. There was no agency creative necessarily behind, uh, the concept. We were very much in control of it and we being kind of me. And so how, cause I feel like sometimes like, I think this is a dream piece for a lot of cinematographers and directors. Cause like you said, there's so much creative control. It looks so cool to like my eyes and what I'm drawn to. It's a no brainer. It's like, yeah, this is what everything should look like. How much are you bringing this really inspired aesthetic to clients like this, this guy who's running the travel business? How much of there is a difference between his taste and your taste? Like, is he seeing it and going, whoa, that's weird. I did not expect it to have, why does it have this film grain? Why does it have this format? Why does it have, you know, or are they just like, yeah, that's sick. Like, because in a way you're setting trends and you're establishing what is possible with the commercial, but you still have the negotiation of like also telling the client, like, it's okay. Like, trust me. Like, do you have to say that at all? Like, trust us. This is cool. People will like this. Or are they just like, yeah, I'm all for it. This looks great. It's kind of a 50, 50 split. A lot of the time um, on that particular project, we had so much control over it that we were just like, we're going to send you something that looks good and I'm going to make sure it's good because it benefits me to make it good because this is one of those projects where if you're not actually, you know, getting paid very much or somebody else feels like they have a lot of creative control over a project, this is a really good opportunity to make it what you want your future work to look like. Mm-hmm. So um, for the sake of a long-term investment, we pulled out as many stops as we could, um, to make it, to make it interesting to us. As long as we liked it, he liked it kind of thing. Um, because he didn't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, we made a couple of other versions for him that had, you know, you know, just different footage in it or catered to more things or, you know, the one that we actually ended up releasing was more of a director's cut of Mm -hmm. the version that we ended up giving to him, but it was more or less the same content. And, um, you know, it's, it's gotten us business. We've used it in pitches. Um, and we've gotten more content because of it. You know, you shoot, you you shoot, you shoot some cowboys on some horses and then pretty soon, you know, 
Wrangler Jeans is calling and being like, hey, have you ever done anything like this? And we're like, well, yes, we have. And it looks like this. Do you find that uh, the creative challenge is like, say you're working with a client and you're trying to push it to the creative maximum that it could be. Like, does it ever happen to you where there'll be that challenge of convincing them or convincing the agent, but then once it's done and it's out there that then the next brand looks at it and goes, oh, that's so sick, let's do that. Not real, like, does that ever happen to you where it's like- Not really, the, the work, the work. How, how hard I had to fight to even get this out and now it's just standard. You know, like once it gets all, through all the, the, all the, the gatekeepers, all the time. now everyone accepts it as good because you had that brand attached to it. Mm -hmm. They okayed it and now to and the that's, world. And that's the name of the game. Like. As long as I really hate when you're pitching a project and at first it seems like this is the one that we're going to be able to do what we want to do and are really good at doing. And then it slowly dies <laughs> by the end. And it's like, okay, we've actually watered down the concept and it's no longer this and it's no longer this. And it's just going to be like every other ad. They don't say it, but that's the reality of what it is. And mm -hmm. we're like, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and you're so involved with the project at that point that you don't really want to say no because you've already spent the time and resources on planning the entire thing. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of the time, like I'm working on a project right now, I have a color session in about 20 minutes, um, where the color will dictate the entire mood of this project. The footage is good. Um, but the song and the color will completely transform what it is now into what we want it to be. But I'm about to sit on a live color session with a couple of creatives that I don't know if I necessarily trust their judgment and I'm going to twist some knobs and show them what they're asking for. Um, instead of me saying, this is what I think is good. And this is what I would publish. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time you just don't have that, you know, you don't have that control unless someone is willing to like take a chance and say, you know, send me your rec. Then um, depending on the team that you're working with, depending on the team that hired you, um, it's up to their discretion to make these major creative choices. Um, because if it were up to me, I would have rewritten the script differently. I would have you know, composed a song, I would have, you know, colored it differently or, or whatever it is. Um, but a lot of the time that's out of your control. So, you know, every once in a while you have clients that hire you because they trust what you do. Um, and the other times they feel like they, they're who knows best and they dictate it. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but in this, in the Fika Patagonia piece, uh, we had a lot of creative control over it, so we could make it how we wanted it, and it's it has been beneficial. Other people go into that and say, "Wow, that's really cool that someone else let you do that." I can envision that on our campaign. Let's do that same exact thing, mm -hmm. except except elevate it. Did I just die? Did I just disappear? <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Um. So before you bounce to that color session, tell me a little bit about um, the Hamilton connection, which I'm imagining is what led to the kind of, you are the guy that is shooting uh, basically Broadway actors, musical careers. Like how, how is that all just kind of through recommendation from one person to the next essentially? So, do you need my video feedback? Are you recording? This no, it's, it's totally fine. I mean, we'll we'll use video, but uh, it's a podcast ultimately. Yeah, it's true. I just but you're also you. a DP, so <laughs> that's the funniest part about. No, uh, well, I'm nervous. So my, that my, audio my camera's will sound plugged bad. into USB, and I don't know why it it says battery exhausted, even though it's being powered. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, we don't have that much time. Um, how did I become? The DP for Broadway actors turned real actors? Is no, Broadway Broadway actors <laughs> musical careers. Yeah, Broadway actors musical careers. That's uh that's a funny story. Um so when Hamilton was nothing, when no one knew what Hamilton was, um, it was an off Broadway production, and when they were going to Broadway, um Hmm. Let's see. How do I start the story? 
Leslie Odom Jr. is the reason why I've done anything with the Broadway community. Um, He reached out to the person who shot his wedding, who his name is Daniel Chestnut, and he runs a production company in L.A. called Process Creative, California, rather. Um, And he used he shot weddings for a while and he ended up shooting Leslie's wedding. And when Leslie was about to go on Broadway as Aaron Burr of Hamilton, um, he was like, I loved my wedding video so much that I want to hire Daniel to come and shoot the opening night of Hamilton because he did such a good job. But Daniel said, uh, I don't know if I can afford to take time away to go shoot this one night. I could probably just hire a freelancer to go shoot it for me. And I can just kind of make some notes on it. Um, so he called me and he was like, Hey, are you freelance? And I said, yes. Um, long time. And he was like, can you go, you know, rent a camera and shoot this thing? It's for this guy who I shot his wedding. Uh, he's really cool. He's in this thing called Hamilton. It's like a rap musical and, uh, it might be good. And I was like, sure. Okay. I actually said no at first because, (laughs) because I was like rap musical. That sounds bad. (laughs) Um, I don't know anything about that. And I told my wife and she was like, I don't know. It sounds like a cool, like New York opportunity. Like, you know, you've never done anything like that. You you might be fun. So I said, okay, sure. And he sent me around to a whole bunch of people's houses the day of, and I just kind of, you know, ignorantly asked them like, how are you feeling about tonight? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they were like, Oh my God, I'm so nervous. It's just like a long time coming. We've been planning this for so long and we're just excited to see everybody's reaction to it. And, da, da, da. and I was like, yeah, great. I have no concept of what this thing is at all. And did they know at that point? I mean, they all had a hunch. I mean, it had gotten to Broadway at that point. So they were all pretty confident that this was going to knock everybody's socks off. Um, which obviously it did. And, uh, you know, then I go over to, um, like the choreographer's house and I'm interviewing him. And then I go over to like Anthony Ramos's house and he's like eating a sandwich and puts on his backpack. And like, we like sit on the subway together, which side note to that, we on that subway trip to the Richard Rogers theater, we realized that we went to the same church, which was like this very interesting serendipitous connection. Um, and I just didn't know that because he would, you know, come in late and leave early, uh, because he was, you know, practicing for this play, um, for this musical. And it was like, no way. And we knew all the same people and had the same friends. And it was like, that's very small world. Anyway, we get to the theater and, uh, you know, I'm filming people like getting ready, putting their makeup on sending out all their little gifts around. And then I meet Leslie and Leslie's so nice. And he's opening his little gifts and he's like, Hey, you should go outside and go film the red carpet. And I was like, the red carpet, who's on the red carpet? Who's, who's coming? What is this? <laughs> and then, you know, you see Samuel L. Jackson, you see like the roots and you see, uh, you know, I mean, it was just, I saw Which, celebrity, celebrity but, after celebrity with the roots. What, what happened with Questlove? Was he actually mad? He was that actually, you were filming? no, he was just checking his teeth. Oh. He was like checking to see if he had anything in his teeth for the photos. So he like took the camera, flipped the like flip screen around. No way. Looked at his teeth and he was like, stop recording, man. Stop playing. And That's then he was like, all right, I'm good. And that was, he wasn't mad. He was just like, let me, let me make sure that in these photos that actually matter, I don't have anything in my teeth. Isn't that funny uh, how the dynamic changes between photographer and videographer depending on the gig? It's like yeah, sometimes these red carpet it, these red carpet photos are going to show up tomorrow in all these publications, and who knows who's ever going to see this kid over here with this camera? <laughs> yeah, did you how how are you navigating the politics of that situation? Because I'm imagining the people don't know that Leslie Odom Jr. gave you the permission to be there. So are you feeling unwanted while you're shooting that? Well, I just didn't feel like I was making any long, any level of long lasting impact. I was Mm -hmm. just like, I am just a fly on the wall. I'm (laughs) shooting this like a wedding. Like they told me to, this isn't that big of a deal. There just happens to be celebrities here. And, and no one questions why are you oh, here? No, no, you no, no. I mean, I, I mean, he gave me, he gave me a, yeah, he gave me a pass to oh, like okay. go to the pit 
where all the other Got photographers it. were kind of thing. Like there was bar- there were barricades and there was, you know, hundreds of people outside uh, outside of the gates, like watching these famous people go into this opening night. And then my wife texted me and she was like, I just, I was driving home from work and I heard on the radio that there's this like huge Broadway show opening tonight called Hamilton. And there's this big like after party and like, that's the thing you're doing. Right. And I was like, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. It seems like there's a whole bunch of people, important people here. So, uh, I think, you know, this might actually be a lot bigger than I think it is. And then from uh, there you go to the after party and then what's that experience? Well, like? no. So then I watched the play. Oh, I watched yeah. the musical. Um, they paired me up. They were like, Hey, by the way, you have a seat buddy. You need to go get tickets from her. And this, it's this lovely woman named, uh, Yvette Nicole Brown, who is this like very famous actor, uh, who was in community. Oh she, yeah, 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 yeah. And she like comes up to me and she's like, Hey, are you Simon? I, I'm your seat buddy. And I was like, what? <laughs> I watched you for like five years on TV and now we're like going to sit together. And she knew all the words to all the songs because she had watched it off Broadway. She was friends with Leslie Odom Jr. Like she was like the hype man for me to be like, Oh my God, this thing one has existed for a lot longer than I think it has uh-huh. existed. Uh-huh. And two people love it and yeah. everyone loved it. And it was, you know, it was just wild. This entire place was packed. I was sitting on the third row with like her and the cast of like the orange is the new black, like orange is the new black. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. And I'm like, I recognize all these people and I'm like surrounded by celebrities and this is so weird. And I just have like a camera and a monopod and I'm trying and, I, and then this, pl- and then this musical happens in all the people that I just spent all day with interviewing who just seemed like totally normal. Like, how do you know that someone is extremely talented and knows all these dance moves and songs and, the, you know, this level of performance when they're just being interviewed, having no context of who these people are. And I'm watching all of these people perform this like incredible thing. And I'm like, none of these people told me that it was like this. None yeah. of these people, like they were so humble and like nonchalant about this entire thing that I was completely like swept off my feet and was just like, Oh my God, this is like the craziest thing I've ever seen. And on top of that, this was the first Broadway show I had ever seen in my whole life. (laughs) It's the first and only Broadway (laughs) show, first and only Broadway show I had ever actually been to. So the entire thing was this brand new experience. Um, yeah. So then I watched the, I watched the show. It's obviously amazing. And then I, they said, as soon as the, lights go off, turn the camera on and record everyone's reaction. So I did. And it was, you know, a standing ovation. We get swept off to the after party and the roots are playing at the after party. And there's like a Macy's gigantic barge outside, like blasting off the biggest fireworks show you've ever seen in your whole life. And like Lin-Manuel gets up on stage and starts like rapping with the roots. And it's this whole thing. And we're just like, Oh my God, how, like, what is this thing? end up coming home at like two 30 that night. And my wife's like, how was it? And I was like, I don't know what just happened, (laughs) (laughs) but I'm pretty sure it was a big deal. Um, yeah. I mean, we edited it together. Um, that job was, was pretty critical, uh, because you know, that video has been watched millions of times now. And, um, most importantly just gave me a, gave me a relationship with all these people who were relatively unknown at the time, all things considered. I mean, they were, they were known, but not as much as they are now. Anthony Ramos has gone on to have a incredible acting career and music career. Leslie is, you know, he's freshly in like the new Sopranos movie on HBO max. And, uh, you know, a handful of these people, David Diggs, like all, everybody who is in that show in the original cast has now gone on to do, amazing things like Jasmine Cephas Jones is now in like a Showtime series. Like it's just like everybody has evolved and skyrocketed since that day. And, you know, I'm happy to know some of them personally now. Um, and yeah, that, that job opened a door to film a music video with Leslie, which then opened a door to film a music video with, Anthony, which then opened the door to, you know, those two jobs were like, Hey, by the way, I'm apparently I'm the one guy who shoots Broadway music careers, music videos. And so then I worked with Ben Platt and that's a whole other story. Anyway, um, that whole part of my career is almost autonomous to everything else that I'm doing. That's like 
totally unique relationships outside of the advertising world. Um, and it's, a, it holds a very special place. And when I get phone calls from any of those guys, I'm like, yep, what are we doing? Let's do it. I'm happy to do it. Well, that's amazing. I love talking to you. Um, I'll let you get to your color session back to, back to the grind. Back and, to reality. Uh, yeah. Back to reality. Snap back. <laughs> Thanks for chatting, dude. This is a blast. This was a blast. Um, I might have some more time this afternoon if you actually want to keep talking. Um, if we feel like there are, I mean, I'm sure we could talk for five hours if we really wanted to. <laughs> right. um, but uh, if you well, let's, let's have you come back after you release uh, these mystery projects. Right. Not to mention all of the mystery projects that are in the can, just not not uploaded. Yes. Well, then, yeah, we'll definitely chat about those. Cool, man. Uh, I'll right. send you this. I'll send you this audio file. Perfect. I'll talk to you later, man. All right. Peace. Thanks, man.